Brexit means Brexit, and we're going to make a success of it. Well, what does it mean? For the last year, it's meant a battle for the soul of Britain, and I've been on the inside of it. We did it! It's a battle where passions run high. Yeah, he's just, just to punch him. <laughs> where nothing is certain. To put it mildly, it's gone tits up. Even when victory seems assured. We know who wears the trousers in this party, and it's Theresa May, and then whatever trousers she wants. But above all, it's a battle at the highest levels of government. To pretend that it's going to be plain sailing is such knuckle-headed lunacy. It makes one wonder why anyone who thinks that is in politics. A battle whose rumbles and murmurings I've captured at every turn. I'm at Britain's most famous street to see the nation's most powerful couple being turfed out by Brexit. Glamorous young things are to be replaced by order, clarity and certainty. And that's the last we see and hear of the new PM and her ministers for months. From behind the neck curtains, word seeps out that Brexit will be no bother. Underway by next March, without any debate, without any opposition and without any election. But Brexit has a way of proving everyone wrong. In a blow to the new PM, appeal court judges rule that Parliament has got a right to debate Brexit after all. hearing a case brought by a private citizen, model-turned-hedge-funder Gina Miller. The Daily Mail, well, they're looking at the uh, judges who took that decision. Uh, the decision immediately stirs a powerful newspaper to uh, anger. Or into an unelected panel of out-of-touch judges. It's something we'll be discussing. The Daily Mail is an absolute disgrace. <laughs> they should be ashamed of themselves. They have taken political reporting to the gutter in this country, engaging in bully boy tactics that is dangerous for democracy. I think that was the most disgraceful and disgusting headline I have read in my entire life, that the, 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 the judges in this country are the enemies of the people. They are actually the guarantors of the freedom of the people. And, and I think it was a disgusting headline. And have you said so to them? I have said so to them, in terms and said so all day long for those that bothered to read it on my absurd Twitter account. <laughs> 22,100 followers, please name. <laughs> the judge's decision ends Mrs May's parliamentary honeymoon, encouraging a handful of Tory Remain MPs to have another crack. The government has so far resisted any even meaningful debate to take place in Parliament about our future relationship with the EU. Why? I don't know. What are they frightened of? They seem to be terrified of allowing members of parliament, A, that we can't have a vote, and secondly, they seem to be determined that we can't even debate and discuss the fundamental principles. Anna's defiance enrages the Tory Brexiteers, never shy about having a row. Yeah, but you have to remember, some of the, some of the Ramoners um, in the Conservative Party, they're very bruised from the referendum. They not only lost the referendum, they lost government office. And if you wanted to be cynical, um, as I might be at this moment, um, you'd say that their only way back into high government office, probably any time soon, is if Brexit's a complete economic disaster. And you really have to see everything they say and everything they do through the prism of that self-interest. Quite honestly, I think Theresa May understands that if we let the people down on delivering Brexit, and, and proper Brexit, not staying in the single market, um, yeah, the political landscape is so volatile that you know, the politicians who appear on the scene over the next five or ten years, if we let the people down, 
will make Farage and Trump look like moderates. Around the globe, Brexit upends the old order. No cosy international diplomacy, a wholly new type of leader. Les Britanniques ont, ont tiré les premiers en quelque sorte. Behind those neck curtains, Mrs. May and her team say some very disobliging things about Donald Trump, confident he can't win. Sorry to keep you waiting, complicated business, complicated. The president-elect wastes no time in repaying her snub. He suggests one of Mrs. May's oldest, bitterest foes as UK ambassador to Washington, the man he calls Mr. Brexit. Come here, come here, Nigel, come here. This guy, you know, they go around calling me Mr. Brexit, and I said, there's only one real... How are you, Nigel? It's a pleasure. To the government's consternation, they discover this isn't entirely a joke. Trump thinks he owes his victory to Farage's anti-establishment template. Well, we'll see you in a couple of seconds. Thank you. What a great honour. He has suggested, of course, that I become the, US, the UK's ambassador in Washington. Um, no, I'm told the wine cellar is very good. Um, it's not going to happen, is it? It, it? It's not going to happen. But, but, but sensibly, you know, I do know a lot of that team who, who are taking you know, quite senior places in the administration. I've known some of them for years. Surely there's something I can do to help cement relations between an administration in Britain who'd be rude about Trump and him as the incoming president. I mean, common sense says there's something I could do. We're at Nigel's favourite Mayfair restaurant. 11.30 a.m., time for a sharpener. Rumours swirl the Brexiteers in the new government want him made a lord and put in the cabinet. Mrs May backs the Remain side, but does so in a very lukewarm manner. She then becomes the Prime Minister and says Brexit means Brexit. I think, gosh, this is good. I like the sound of this. This is great. And then five months go by and nothing happens. I want to see some direction because I'm hearing this new Chancellor fellow, Hammond is his name, no one knows who he is, saying we might stay in the customs union. Boris saying we're definitely leaving. The left hand and the right hand clearly are not quite sure what's going on. Um, I worry they're gonna fudge it. Now only four months to go till that Brexit deadline. Cabinet members mutter to me about Kim jong May, about it being her way or no way. Sure enough, she appeals the judge's decision, going all the way to the Supreme Court. It's the first major test of her government. Her opponent stays publicly silent. It, it's pretty intense. Um, we know where you are, we know where you live, you're traitors. I need to be the second Joe Cox and all this sort of stuff has started up again. From, from some senior police around the house last night um, who put in panic alarm systems all around the house because the worry we now is that if anyone discovers our home address. This Gina Miller. Yes. Woman is now, oh, people are being nasty to me. I've had a death threat. I've got 10 death threats in there I've had this week, which I've sent to the Metropolitan Police. And do you know what they'll do? No. No. Absolutely nothing. So this is all being presented that Brexit has led to, you know, a rise in hate crime and all this appalling behavior. Yeah, I'm sure a few louts have behaved pretty badly since Brexit. I suspect they were behaving pretty badly before Brexit, to be honest with you. But the hate that's been put against us on our side of the argument, yeah. that, that story isn't getting a look at. I think the trouble is with people like Nigel Farage, I'm, I'm actually not sure that you can have any longer a sensible, reasoned conversation with them. That's what worries me. If he would like a one-way ticket to America uh, and continue his campaigning and his work in America, I'm sure I could organise a a whip round. In fact, I'd probably pay for that one-way ticket myself. <laughs> Day two of the hearing. It's looking increasingly likely that Mrs May is going to lose. Her barrister, top QC David Panic, trounces the Attorney General. I, I thought Lord Panic's case was absolutely magnificent. I watched it here. I should have been writing letters. And I watched it here, and he was as smooth as a Vaseline otter, I thought. 
He was absolutely wonderful. And I mean, it was a privilege to watch that. And I just do not see the Supreme Court overturning the judgment of the lower court. I don't see it. Public gain, private pain. There's a cost to all this. I got home last night to find out that the police have made an arrest last night. And the charge is, is um, an inciting violence. The police decide to keep the arrest quiet for fear of triggering more dangerous incidents. To my surprise, it's a fear the Brexiteers turn out to share, if for rather different reasons. Oh, the consequences of not delivering Brexit would be extremely serious in the country at large. In 1832, the Duke of Wellington had to put iron shutters in his windows because the great hero of Waterloo was being pelted with stones by people who thought he was obstructing reform. It is very, very rare in British history that the British people have taken to the streets over a denial of democracy, but it is not impossible. In this fevered environment, the Labour Party decide they would like to take advantage of the divisions opening up in the hitherto impregnable government. I mean, they have said one thing one day, another thing the next day, and then usually on the third day, a spokesperson says, we haven't decided. I think the Prime Minister is struggling with the different elements in her party who have been fighting over Europe for 40 years. The future of this country is bound up with these negotiations. Keir asks that the government satisfy five conditions before Brexit. I discover he's been privately assured that a bunch of Tories are ready to rebel. The vote on the 23rd of June was not a vote to write those that voted to remain out of their own history. Brexit or no Brexit, politics is eternal. The assurances are worthless. There's only one unrepentant Tory rebel. Leave the European Union. Uh, I think the truth is, uh, and yesterday's debate confirmed this in my mind, that nobody, probably from the Prime Minister downwards, has the first idea how events are going to unfold next year. We're on an unknown journey. Uh, they have no agreement on any important feature of policy between themselves. Their policy wouldn't fill one side of A4 at the moment, and they're still discussing it. Trouble piling up for the PM final day at the Supreme Court. To my non-legal eyes, it's not looking good. At four o'clock, the law lords retire for their verdict. Gina Miller poised for victory, a victory the ever-loyal Brexiteers are already decrying. I, I think the this is a day of history is a good thing to say at the top of the six o'clock news to encourage people to carry on watching until 6.25 but isn't necessarily more profound than that. And has Mrs Miller spent her money wisely? That's a matter of Mrs Miller. Um, people have all sorts of hobbies. Some people like yachts, some people like um, being uh, litigants, and clearly Mrs Miller likes being a litigant. It's absolutely worth it. Why would anybody want to make themselves a celebrity so that you get death threats? At the end of the day, you attack the person, not the policies or the arguments, when you have nowhere else to go. And frankly, they're just cowards. I'm sorry, be a man, because most of them are men. Come and talk to me and find out my motivations. If you don't have that courage, then just shut up. This whole portrayal of good v bad, she's good. Uh, she said earlier today that she'd received abuse for what she'd done. It's because she's black. That's why. Yeah, says it all, doesn't it? So? Says it all. And yet that gets broadcast. And again, we're all meant to think that's true. Can you imagine the media portraying a story that I've been unfairly treated because of who I am? You know, I'll do a press conference, I went to a public school and I'm white, and that's why they're being beastly to me. Do you think they'd run that? It's Christmas. Now only three months to go till that Brexit deadline. And there's an odd fashion-oriented sign of the tension privately gripping Downing Street. One of the few Tory Remainers criticises Mrs May's choice of trousers in a Vogue fashion shoot. Immediately, the spinners shoot down the former Education Secretary, banning her from number 10. 
the regret is, um, if you have concerns, you should voice them privately to the Prime Minister and her team in her office, uh, not being asked about them in you know, a, a newspaper interview. Um, we live and learn, and that's the whole point about this, um, this, this thing of politics. A hint that number 10's tactics have backfired, only strengthening her resolve. It would be nice to see that there, you know, in the early part of 2017, that there is a plan, that it is published, that it is there for parliamentary scrutiny, and that we have it before the government triggers Article 50. But for now, Nikki is still a mere speck in the ocean of Brexiteer joy. I'm completely happy, especially after the Opposition Day debate, that we have the votes to get it through Parliament. Um, I don't mind voting to leave the European Union every week. I mean, it, it suits me and suits my constituents. And uh, it will show those members of Parliament perhaps who have a disregard for um, public opinion and democracy. You are a singer, Bridget. No, I'm not. But if, <laughs> you know, I do like singing. Um, I... He's so moved, he offers to see out 2016 in song. Give us a it. It. You it want is. it? You want it? I want it. Even when the stormy clouds are in the sky, you mustn't sigh and you mustn't cry. Spread a little happiness as you go by. Thank you. But I hear his happiness isn't universal. The PM is privately worried about her majority, a wafer-thin 12 and increasingly alarmed by mutterings about what on earth Brexit does mean. So on a cold winter morning, she sets off for Lancaster House to silence the doubters. As a priority, we will pursue a bold and ambitious free trade agreement with the European Union. It should give British companies the maximum freedom to trade with and operate within European markets. But I want to be clear. What I am proposing cannot mean membership of the single market. <coughs> Absolutely delighted. Because under this Conservative I think uh, the, the we'll sceptics sure are fully vindicated and it's going to go down really well in the country. I mean, at the end of the day, Brexit is going to be Brexit. And, a, you know, a Prime Minister, a politician actually delivering on what they've got a mandate from the people to do so. How novel. I think it might catch up. It's going to be very popular, isn't it? And what we do know is we know, we know who wears the trousers in this party, and it's Theresa May, and then whatever trousers she wants. And I don't believe that the EU's leaders will seriously tell... I thought that it was good, and I understand uh, from the one ambassador that I have spoken to this afternoon that they thought that it was much better than they feared. So I think it was good. Now, I've spoken to Nick Clegg on the way down the lift, who believes that it's Hiroshima, but the Brexiteers are thrilled with, you know, in front of the queue and all that sort of stuff. Yes, but the Brexiteers, darling old things, you know, they're, they're pleased. It doesn't take much. You chuck them a bit of red meat and they have an absolute accident on the spot. You know, I mean, they're, they're awful. But they don't have any idea of how long it takes to do a trade deal. So you're feeling a bit lonely at the moment? No, I always feel lonely. Hell, I look conservative. No, no, no. Um, being serious. No, not, no, not really. You just battle on, don't you? And number 10, what are they saying to you? Well, they don't talk to me. I'm, I'm just a mere backbencher. You know, this place is being excluded from the process. So your voice is not being heard, especially if you're a 48 percenter. Brexit was meant to enable the UK to turn to traditional allies. But things are still no better across the pond. No date's been set for a first visit by the British PM. Donald Trump is about to be inaugurated. He decides to reassert the public importance of his British ally. Oh, wow, wow. Did you take it with you? God bless you. Oh, you. Love you. Oh, I <laughs> Nigel grabs the opportunity to rub Theresa's nose in it. America! That's right, you God bless you. Yeah, well, Brexit would be helpful. Yeah, Brexit. Yeah, Brexit. So it's just come together, Trump, you, and, and America. We're all here to see the greatest president. Then he invites me to a high society bash. How do you think this is going down back home? Well, well I hope. 
the, the logical conclusions you'll draw is that actually myself and my friends have got some fantastic connections here in Washington that ought to be used. I'm sure logical win through. You're right. And how do you think it is going down back home? Oh, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Sh I think they're appalled, you know. It's inauguration day. How's today? Uh, more like a coronation. <laughs> <laughs> Backstage, Nigel gets the audience the PM can only dream of. Just two months till Brexit, and I'm back at the Supreme Court. It's D-Day. Does Parliament get the say in Brexit that the PM doesn't want it to have? bag of nerves this morning, lots of different emotions, uh, relieved that it's going to be over finally and I can get my life back because I only anticipated it going up to October. It wasn't supposed to be quite so many months. I can't think about it about winning, it's just about the right thing. I'm thinking about it about right and wrong rather than winning or losing because I think it's right that we uphold our constitutional law and that we go to Parliament and the people we elect do their job. And I think it's wrong of the government to have thought that they could just go off and do what they wanted to. I see she's now a philanthropist, self-styled, I presume. Well, that's how the BBC described a philanthropist, so she must be a good person. Wasn't she? But I just find that description of her fascinating. In broad terms, Article 50 provides that a country wishing to leave the EU must give a notice in accordance with its own constitutional requirements. Therefore, the government cannot trigger Article 50 without Parliament authorising that course. It has the opposite effect. Yes. The referendum is of great political of significance. I'm not listening to the judgment. But the Act of Parliament <laughs> did not say Credit. what should happen Credit. as a result. For all the playing to my camera, Farage is an astute politician. He knows Mrs May has been wounded by today's ruling. The one thing I'm just beginning to think is I'd always thought there's no chance of an early general election. You know, Mrs May's not the kind of person that takes risks and does things, but I'm, I'm just, in the last 24 hours, beginning to think that if Copeland goes to the Tories and if Stoke were to go to UKIP, you would have a really fatally weakened uh, Labour Party and that may be her opportunity to go for a spring election. No general election yet, but instead a surprise by-election as a Labour MP resigns. It's in the very place the government want. The Brexit capital of Britain. It's a pivotal moment in political history. For Labour, Brexit poses an existential crisis. It gives the Labour Party a great headache because the Labour Party is so deeply split between its different electoral voting bases. So its major metropolitan London voting base is very international, it's very uh, pro-European, it's very much the intellectual elite. Its voting base outside London, particularly in the north of England, was very much at the forefront of wanting to vote to leave and they represent seats where 70% voted to leave and those two voting bases have been sundered apart and it's very hard to bring those two together. The Labour Party, I mean they were hopeless last year in the referendum campaign and they're hopeless now and I actually feel very sorry for friends who are in the Labour Party because I think they are watching their party go through its death throes. UKIP are desperately hoping they'll replace Labour as the party of opposition, sweeping up their heartland seats. Privately, number 10 wouldn't mind that too. UKIP's new leader announces he'll stand. So how's it going? It's going really well, on the doors, very good, looking positive. Opinion poll yesterday, has got a six points ahead, so no, we're pretty confident. And what's happening to the Labour vote? 
But people are crying out for change. That's the one thing which keeps coming back all the time. They've had Labour MP for 50 years. People now want something better. The Liberals? Haven't seen him. Yeah. And the Labour guy? Um, Haven't seen him either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Labour may be a shambles, but it turns out UKIP are no better. Personality issues gnaw away at their campaign. The cry goes up, bring back the man who's had enough of politics. <laughs> Safely back in W1, it's a rather different private story. We've got a very tough couple of weeks coming up. Um, and I think UKIP... I think UKIP needs to make one or two changes. At the moment, I'm not entirely happy with where we are, but I've got a big meeting with Paul this afternoon. And don't forget, and I've, you know, I'm a veteran of these by-elections. I know how it works, and I would hate to see us lose by 600 votes, or 1,000 votes, or whatever it is, because we just hadn't quite done it properly. So, you know, there's still all to play for, but we're going to have to up our game slightly. I didn't lose anybody that day. You say you, you lost a close person, no, close no, person no. of friend. Unfortunately, That's what happens is that Paul Nuttall gets drawn into another Someone damaging know, personal row. January 9th, 2012, on your own site. Whether he was or was not at the Hillsborough disaster. It's on your own website, Paul. The story was twisted, and uh, I am... I'm pretty disgusted by it, to be honest with you. I think that this issue should be above politics, and I don't think people should you know, try to score political points from it. How's it going, candidate? It's going OK. Um, well, yeah, it's... Interesting I've, I've, weekend for you. I've been under attack, sustained attack. Um, I suppose it's to be expected. It, 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 this is touch and go. This is really tight, and, uh, you know, they know that. Proof indeed that it is touch and go right outside. I am going to vote against UKIP. I am one of the very few who voted to stay in the EU. My father was an immigrant and he was the loveliest man you could ever meet. How dare Paul Nuttall show his face in this city? Racist, anti-immigration bastard! Polls close. Labour win. Eight and fifty three votes. You could lose. I mean, wouldn't uh, Nigel Farage have done better? Yeah. <laughs> no chance. Oh, no, not oh. at all. No chance. <laughs> For all the bluster, you could know they've blown a golden opportunity. Can all the, press get back? the very next day, a surprise visitor come to bathe in Labour's Lazarus-like escape. How are you? Lovely to see you, Gareth. Congratulations, Congratulations Gareth. Wonderful result. Wonderful result. Wonderful, result. wonderful, wonderful to have you elected, Gareth. Are you, are you still in favour of it? Wonderful wonderful to have you. Can I be the first to come here today to congratulate you on being elected the new MP for Stoke-on-Trent Central? It doesn't go entirely to plan. One thing I've learned about the media is that you're incredibly rude to each other. Well, can I well, just well, why, why can't you learn to be polite just, to each other? Just a simple question. Right, well, 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 thank you. Thank you. Only a month till Theresa May's Brexit deadline. Two of her certainties gone. Labour are alive and Parliament is set to debate Article 50. We will not be threatened into not fulfilling our normal yeah. constitutional yeah. goal. Mrs May's core team couldn't care less. They know Labour will have to go along with them or risk electoral suicide. It's the opposition inside government that worries them. Eventually, one minister breaks rank to talk to me. This is real uncharted waters. The prospect of getting a single collective voice amongst the 27, let alone the European Parliament and the Walloons and potential referenda in one or two countries, means that the chance of getting that kind of coherent unanimity we need around a constructive deal mm. is fraught with difficulty. And uh, I can't see at the moment 
any route to a pain-free exit. I think a lot of people will sort of turn over in the middle of the night and think, is there a way out of this? But at the moment, I don't think there is one. Where are the divisions inside government? Tory Remainers resist Whip's blandishments and fight on. I have need to look at the numbers, but there were nine of us who sat out and abstained from the vote, and that was a big block of abstentions, and I think that was noticed. Um, and we wait to see. I mean, this is going to be a long game. We are at the, um, only the start of the whole Brexit process. We are now properly a group, and this is all about putting down markers so that when the moment comes, the bigger battles, which undoubtedly will be ahead of us, hopefully we will gain the support and common sense will prevail. But Remainer's plucky resistance outside and inside government isn't enough to stop the Brexit juggernaut. of March, Brexit finally means Brexit. Article 50 is to be triggered. Cometh the hour, cometh the media. Cometh the man who's always loved and benefited from the limelight. You've been triggered. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost as though Stoke never happened. How are you? All right. Thank you so much for the Good man. Good man. It's very nice to see you again. Well, it's great to be here. And, uh, and I hope you have fun. The Article 50 process is now underway. Britain is leaving the European Union. We are going to make our own decisions and our own laws. Nigel, you have a pint in your hand. You've got uh, Theresa May's letter in your other hand. Are you a happy man? Oh, very happy. Look, I mean, today for me was the day that the impossible dream came true. What do you want to say to, to French people today? Come and join us. Take back your independence. Come on in. The water's lovely. <laughs> Joy, however, is not entirely unconfined. OK, right, hello. Hello, enjoying yourself. Right. Are we going to move yeah, Well, yes, we I've are. just been asked to nominate what song I want to have on the uh, radio in a moment when I do it. And uh, someone's just saying, oh, to Joy, that the day's arrived, the phony war is over, now the negotiations start. Yes, an excellent day. The process is now underway. And so as you ripped the covers off this morning, what was your first thought? My first thought? Um, well, salva feste dies toto venerabilis evo. Which I can even play for you, actually. I've got it. I've been listening to this. Here we go. What is it? Hail festal day, venerable through all ages. It just seems to be an entirely appropriate theme for Brexit, as we're finally getting out of the European Union. I mean, for people like me, and there are many of us, there are millions of us, this is a sad day. However, this is the beginning, not necessarily of the end, it's the beginning of who knows what. Uh, my job is to continue to scrutinise. My fear is that Look, what is the one thing we know the, the hardline Brexiteers don't want? They don't want time, because the British people might come to their senses. Yeah. They might change their mind. I shouldn't be too upset today. You are, though, aren't you? Well, oh, it's just a bit shit, isn't it? Happy days are here. Theresa May is, uh, is walking on air at the moment. I suggested that we went for a snap election immediately after triggering Article 50. But... Um, Number 10, I'm not going to go for that. Um... But what do you know? The last of Mrs May's Brexit certainties crumbles. 
she calls a general election and rams it through Parliament. I think everyone was taken completely by surprise. I just did not see that it was going to get through the House of Commons until she made the decision and then I thought, she's going to get this through the House of Commons because the Labour Party are going to be a bunch of lemmings and in this massive sort of sacrificial act of collective suicide, they're going to vote for an election. Oh, so she's played a blinder and the judgement of getting it through the Commons, which in my view is the biggest hurdle overcome, is a stroke of genius. I, I'm, I'm still a bit disbelieving. <laughs> when you're going into those negotiations, you don't want to be watching your back in Westminster at the same time. And we do have a relatively small majority and we do have some Ramonas, as you know, some unreconcilable Ramonas. But they seem quite reconciled now from what I've seen to the last few days. A, a general election does pull the Conservative Party together. It pulls any party together. Obviously yeah. not the Labour Party. We can't find many Labour MPs who, would, who actually would vote for Jeremy Corbyn to be Prime Minister, but that's understandable, isn't it? Newspaper polls give the PM a commanding lead. Labour's internal ones are even worse. You voting in the election? I am. Are you voting this way? Of course. Excellent. <laughs> I'm in Stoke as Eddie Izzard comes to give life support to two despairing MPs. <laughs> New boy Gareth Snell and his minder, Ruth Smith. I don't feel like I've stopped from the by-election, so this is, uh, just as I'd started to recover a little bit, off we go, and this is in my constituency. Well, we will be in my constituency in a bit. And what are the odds for you? I'm currently projected to lose. <laughs> By contrast, the leitmotif of the Tory campaign is total control. The public, and all but the most loyal of the media, are ruthlessly excluded from all press events. I'm outside the East Midlands launch to hear the faithful. Theresa gave her... Uh rousing speech to launch the campaign in the Midlands, talking about strong and stable leadership and the choice that's there. Um, there was quite a good piece written by a, a former Labour MP who's a journalist, and he spoke uh, about John McDonnell, who he said, despite appearing an affable cove, uh, with his affable exterior, you can't help but think at night he's making lists of people who will be shot straight after the revolution. wobbles. There'll be a wobbly Wednesday and a tetchy Tuesday and a sort of Thursday tantrum. I mean, it's in the nature of campaigns, but I have to say it's, it's pretty steady at the moment and no one else is really sort of, you know, making any impact, I sense. There's certainly no threat from UKIP. I'm at the campaign press launch, only to see it turn into a disaster. Why are you putting up racist propaganda? People are allowed to wear right what they like. Women are... Don't touch me. Do not touch me. Excuse me, could you please leave? Women are allowed to wear what they like. Women are allowed to wear what they like. It's time Excuse to stand me. up against you. Like that sort of racist figure, the white scarcer. <laughs> hundred miles east, the party's former leader may have started the year with the US president, but now, to make ends meet, he's at the end of the pier. What happened to the protest? Don't know. Didn't materialise by the looks. Oh. Not a bad thing. There might be somebody in here. I must, I must be going downhill. Please put your hands together. An evening with Nigel Farage contains 20 years of hits. A little secret. Angela Merkel, in private, is even more miserable than she appears to be in public. <laughs> I am not anti-European at all. I've married German women. <laughs> oh, Juncker, he's, um, crikey. <laughs> I thought I liked to drink, bloody hell. Um... And in private a rather familiar threat. 
At the moment, I've done pretty much all I can do. And if, at the end of this Brexit period, the government have not done what the people asked them to do, then I would have no choice but to don khaki and head back to the front lines. I mean, if that's what it comes to. In the trenches, it's not looking great for Labour. Hello, darling. It's Ruth. Oh, darling, I really wish you hadn't done that. You know you'd be voting for me, not for him. But you know it's... Oh, no. It's going you... well, then. <laughs> <laughs> it's throwing his postal boat away. There is, unfortunately, a little bit of a theme at the moment. At this point, I honestly think it will be when people are, just as we heard actually, when people have got their ballots in front of them, they don't know what, I, I don't think they know yet what they're going to do with them. Whether they think they're voting for me, whether they think they're voting Labour, or whether they think they're voting for Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn. And I don't think anyone knows yet. Right. So um, the count will be fun. <laughs> <laughs> But incredibly, imperceptibly, the polls are tightening. Labour's leader is a man reborn. His Brexit trauma, a distant memory. At 12 o'clock in a Reading car park, the crowds flock to him. Let's give him a round of applause, Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour He even turns Mrs May's refusal to debate him into a positive. It's very odd that you have an election campaign where we go out and talk to people all the time and the Prime Minister seems to have difficulty in meeting anyone or having a debate. And so there is a debate in Cambridge tonight. I don't know what she's doing this evening, but it's not far from London. I invite her to go to Cambridge and debate her policies, debate her record, debate their plans, debate their proposals and let the public make up their mind. I know it's uncharacteristic of someone of me to say this, but I think a little bit of humility is due in the polling of this thing. I have no idea. I think the idea the Tories are going to get a landslide of 150 seats is absolute rubbish. I think we'll get a decent working majority. Off to Cambridge for said debate, and another hero's welcome. No Mrs Mayor, of course, just a brave Home Secretary. before we, the electorate, make our choice. And tonight, the representatives of seven parties are here to make their pitch to our audience here in Cambridge and to you at home. Away from the crowd's adulation, the debate's a sticky experience for Labour's leader. And we have to stop thinking, as you do, that there's a magic money to it. What we need to do is recognise the human rights and justice of people all around the world. And I want to make sure that we get the right result under Theresa May. And you stood on a platform just about a year ago saying that you thought that Britain would be safer, stronger, and better off in the EU. But just turning up has given Labour the PR advantage it needs. If I was Amber Rudd, I would be on the phone to Theresa May tonight and say, listen, Theresa, I know that we're friends, but quite frankly, I had a really hard time tonight and you really owe me because you put me in a very difficult position and you should have gone and done that job yourself. Okay, lots of big smiley faces. The polls tighten, Labour make hay with Tory care plans, Alarm is felt in even the bluest of blue seats. I don't know what the result is going to be any more than you do, but I suspect that the social care thing put a break on our progress, and I think it took the froth and the cream off a, a very big majority. And I worry for the Prime Minister that this could rebound on her. 
I wish I knew what it was going to be like on Thursday night. Somebody peed on my poster, but they don't realise I caught on CCTV. <laughs> they've, they've trashed our posters. They've pulled them down. Um, they've uh, put graffiti on. Bastards. And yes, I have worn these shoes throughout the whole of the campaign. I bought them at the beginning of the campaign. They're incredibly comfortable. And they're knackered. No. <laughs> and what about that landslide? I have no idea. And even if I did know, I wouldn't share it with you. I don't know, would I share it with you? No, I think we'll do well. I think she'll get 50, 80, it could be higher. Cabinet? Who's going to be in that? I don't know, but I can tell you one thing. I won't be there. I bet you any money. She'll not have me back. I won't be back. Do you know what? I can say this because you're not going to broadcast it until <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if Amber Rudd becomes Chancellor. Boris? I have no idea. I don't know what's going to happen to Boris. See, whenever I see Boris, I'm always nice to him, and we always have a lot of fun. But I, I do struggle with him as our Foreign Secretary. I think we do need a big, serious grown-up. Wait the start of this last debate between Jeremy Corbyn and Theresa May in front of an audience of voters coming up in about 10 minutes' time. Another sign of Tory nerves. The Foreign Secretary is brought out from whatever cupboard he's been hidden in. I think it's perfectly obvious that the Labour, so you think the Labour Party do not More have a credible plan in Britain is a good for deal. negotiating with the European Union. They are prepared to take any well, terms that are going. Most of the European they are prepared to take any terms Boris. that are going. And I doubt very much. Can you leave a list much, of the countries you've not I doubt very much. In your, in your I doubt very leave. much. What about the pensions? What about the social care camp? Yeah, it's just, just punch him. <laughs> the leader of the Conservative Party, the Prime Minister, Theresa May. The leaders are evenly matched, but in the spin room, the Tories' attack dog overplays his hand. Because you've helped coordinate this campaign. Sorry, Boris, just a second. Have you helped coordinate this Labour campaign? And he's Hang on, Boris, in the Brexit just, just a second. Sorry, he's just been shouting my ear. Well, uh, just a bit of peace. You help coordinate this campaign. He's never used a food bank. He's never been to a food no, bank. No, right, I, I'm, actually, I started... Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Well, Hang on a second. I, I, what I, I want to do... You take that Boris, back, old boy. Take no, it back. No, well, why take don't you just sort this out? Hang on a second. Why don't you take it back? I just want. I just want to hear. You just pointed in my face. I want to hear from. <laughs> let's hear from Jeremy Corbyn. This is what he had to say about that nuclear deterrent. Perfect. How do you think it went? I, I, I mean, I, you know, I thought that uh, genuinely. I thought the prime minister's uh, performance was extremely good. You know, she was crisp. She got robust. She got all the, the points across, and I was, I was, I was very alarmed by, by Corbyn. And I think it's extraordinary that at this point in our history, the Labour Party should have thrown up this this character to, uh, as their candidate. Nick Soames thinks we've reached peak Corbyn. Ah, uh, look, you know, but, uh, we'll see what happens next week, but... <laughs> It's the eve of the election, and Boris's deputy is every bit as worried as his master. The mood amongst the voting public, I, I would say, has gone sour. And, um, you know, we've ended up with a campaign which has begun to make Jeremy Corbyn look credible. That's not a happy achievement. Some of the traditional Labour voters who he used to alienate are now saying, OK, well, we've... At least, he's at least he's not a Conservative. So I, I think this has closed quite a lot. And to me, I, I, I think the mood is very worrying. He points the finger firmly at those advising the Prime Minister. One thing I think has been particularly distasteful is having, if you like, pre-shuffle briefing about who's going to be the next Chancellor in the middle of an election campaign. I mean, this is culpable. This is utterly unacceptable. 
I think the animosity towards the sort of coterie has become very, very, very intense. And um, it is a problem. Uh, whether a really big thumping result would see that go away altogether, I'm afraid I'm now not sure. Over 30,000 people, 144 polling stations were questioned today. And by the magic of sophology, we're able to predict what we think has happened tonight. And what we're saying is the Conservatives are the largest party. Note, they don't have an overall majority at this stage. 340. If those are even vaguely accurate, then I don't need a concession speech tonight, which I've just finished writing. <laughs> I'm delighted if we're a step closer to a Labour government, but if we're in a period of, of instability, of unstable government, not this strong and stable thing that she's been pushing, we're about we're renegotiating Brexit. And because of the arrogance of the Prime Minister, what happens now, this is, you know, the country, the world has never been more scary or unsettled. When are we going to negotiate our exit? We have triggered Article 50. What happens next? Boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, are we going to be hung, drawn and quartered if this is all wrong? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I leave the happy family and belt 60 miles down the road to Beeston. Counting's just underway, and it looks like Anna's in trouble. We called this election on the, on the basis we were 20 points ahead, that we had this astonishing prime minister who we were all her candidates. She was strong and stable and everything else. And to put it mildly, it's gone tits up. And if Theresa's in trouble, a strong and stable leader. It's Jeremy Corbyn. That, that landslide that we all predicted, the 90 plus, isn't going to happen. It's not just her. Up and down the country, safe seats are falling. Hello, with more than 90 seats counted in the general election, Labour have gained three seats, one from the SNP in Scotland and three from the Tories. I'm very upset, so many of my good, good colleagues have left, lost, Jane Ellison has lost. Terrible, 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 very sad. Another shock on a night of shocks. Nick Clegg, Liberal Democrats, 19,756. Jared O'Mara, Labour Party, 21,000. Hang on, I'm sending a text to Nick Clegg. Are you? Oh, what are you saying? No, I'm not telling you. A hundred miles south, and it's time for the rice slip result. Number of votes cast for each candidate is as follows Alexander Boris de Fethel Johnson. Conservative Party, 23,716. His majority halved, but Boris is still an MP. And I'm proud to be re-elected as the Member of Parliament for Uxbridge and South Rice. Thank you very much. For once, he rushes away without talking to the media. No hostages to fortune if there's going to be a leadership battle. We have just heard a rumour, I put it no stronger than that, uh, that the Tories may be in trouble in Hastings. It's a tight race there, Amber Rudd. A certain BBC journalist has just sent me a text saying, many commiserations. And I replied, I haven't lost yet. He said, blimey. Misinformed and very embarrassed. Apologies. But Labour and Tory are neck and neck. The clerk orders a recount. Back in Stoke, both Ruth and Gareth have won against the odds. 
Presidential politics doesn't work in this country. May wanted Theresa versus Jem, and what she got was the Tory party versus the Labour party, and the Labour party smashed her. She can't deliver anything now. She needs to go. I just hope that it's election. not another election. The likelihood still that there's going to be a Tory government of some sort, whether that's minority or propped up by the DUP. What there will be is a strong and stable Labour opposition. I guarantee that. <laughs> I need a holiday. I need some sleep. Joy in the morning in Stoke, but back down the road, it's still tense. Sigrid Anna Mary, the Conservative Party candidate, 25,980. Anna squeaked it by 800 votes and wastes no time in letting me and pretty much anyone know how she feels. There's disaster nationally. It's absolutely appalling. But we called this to increase our majority and apparently to strengthen the Brexit hand. Election programme, are you able to... They want to get you on as soon as it's possible. Which election one? The BBC oh, One right. election programme. Yeah, and everything, we... yeah. I think she's in a very difficult place. She's a, a remarkable and she's a very talented woman uh, and she doesn't shy from difficult decisions, but she now has to obviously consider her position. <laughs> A year on, and I'm back at Downing Street. The PM, once again, mortally wounded by Brexit, and all it actually means. Rumours swirl amongst the media. Uh, a very good night. He did turn the tide, really, in that election against Mrs May. She's going. She's not. Jeremy Corbyn is measuring the curtains. Eventually, news seeps out. She's off to the palace. Her government kept in place by a deal with Ulster's hardline democratic unionists. Back from Her Majesty, in defiant mood. It is clear that only the Conservative and Unionist Party has the legitimacy and ability to provide that certainty by commanding a majority in the House of Commons. That's what we will deliver. Now let's get to work. It's very easy to say, oh, you know, get rid of her, but it's very difficult to say, oh, well, this is what should follow. So unless we, you know, we risk having splits everywhere, complications, you know, uh, it, it just it's not, doesn't bear thinking about. Just be sensible. Be steady, no plotting, no manoeuvring, make this work. I think, the, I think that what will happen is that almost any, you've seen it in the, in, the, in the way the news has reacted over the last year, you know, Mrs. Miggins' cat run over, Brexit. Uh, you know, your neighbour moves house, Brexit. You know, house prices up, Brexit. House prices down, Brexit. Everything is ascribed to, to Brexit. There will be bumps on the road. Some plaster will come off the ceiling from time to time and there will be some um, excitable headlines, but we'll end up in a very, very good place. So what about Boris? Um, well, he's just got to resist the temptation to, you know, play games, really. He mustn't do that. And right. uh, he must just be part of the stable you know, cabinet government we want to see. Uh, forgive me for this. I have to ask the boring question. No run against her. She stays where she is. No, absolutely not. Uh, I think nobody wants to see. I think this is what the Prime Minister has said and what everybody.